right, so let's go ahead and start back up with a, a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll go ahead and ask Our Lady to please pray for us in this remaining time together for tonight's lesson, to persevere into the end with grace and a strong intellectual stamina, an increase in intellectual stamina so that we can get through it. And so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So just a quick note as a reminder, uh, we are recording these lessons, both in audio and video format, and each week, if you're getting the emails, I don't know if you're getting the emails, but I sent out a newsletter, a note that uh, when I get the talks produced, I put them up on the website. And I'll let you know that they're available on the website so that you can go back and watch these videos again and sort of let it sink in because it is a lot. I am throwing a lot out at you, as I always do, but that's why we record it. So you can go back and listen to it over and over again and assimilate it into your own heart and mind. We left off with reflecting upon the divine quality of sacred scripture and a precise understanding of the church's teaching about the divine quality of sacred scripture and what the church means uh, in saying that the scriptures are inspired by God and the span of that inspiration covering the entirety of the books of the Bible both in the Old and the New in all their parts and consequently all the parts of sacred scripture having God as their author and therefore inerrant without error because as Pope Leo the 13th stated inspiration and errant inspiration and error cannot coexist so if God has inspired the entirety of the books of the Bible with all their parts well then God is the author of the books of the Bible with all their parts and if God is the author of the books of the Bible with all their parts then all the parts are free from error now we pick back up in this particular segment with the second quality of sacred scripture, and that is the human quality. We made reference to it in a few instances previously in, in our last segment, but now we're going to kind of look at it in a systematic way. And the first catechetical point about the human quality is that scripture has real human authors. Although the church says the scriptures have God as the primary author, in no way is she discrediting the human authorship of these historical documents that are inspired by God. Here's what the Catechism states in paragraph 106. If you have your Catechism, you can follow along, or you can just follow along in the PowerPoint. Quote, God inspired the human authors of the sacred books. To compose the sacred books, God chose certain men who all the while he employed them in this task, here's the key phrase, made full use of their own faculties and powers. So that though he acted in them and by them, there's the divine quality, it was as true authors that they consigned to writing whatever he wanted written and no more, close quote. I emphasize the catechism statement, it was as true authors. So they used their own faculties and powers and so therefore they were truly authors of the text. So, here's a little list of, of things to keep in mind when we're trying to get an understanding of the real human authorship of Scripture. They were not mechanical robots, okay? It's not as if the sacred writers were passively writing the text like robots and God, you know, putting some sort of computer program in the human authors to spit out what he wants them to spit out. That's not what it is. That would take away from the human aspect of the sacred text. They freely used their own faculties of intellect and will. So the author had to use his own intellectual judgment, own, had to go through an intellectual process of gathering the information, first of all, learning the information from the sacred paradosis in Greek is what we call it, that is the Christian heritage or the Christian tradition, and then he had to make certain intellectual judgments about what parts of the sacred tradition he wanted to put down in writing and then actually exercise his will to do it. 
So he's using his own human faculties of intellect and will, thus constituting the human quality of the documents of the Bible. Thirdly, they wrote to a particular audience with a particular message. And the audience to whom the author is writing actually determines what he chooses to put in the sacred text, whether it be a gospel or a letter that is being written. So, for example, Matthew writes to a Jewish audience, right? Well, that determines some things that he chooses to put in his gospel to record what Jesus said. Whereas the other gospel writers who are not writing to Jews but are writing to Gentiles don't choose, do not choose to put in their gospel some of the things that Jesus said and did. So for one example, uh, Matthew chapter 16 verse 19, Jesus tells Simon, or now changes his name to Peter, and says, I give to you the keys of the kingdom, right? Well, that's not found in the other Gospels. Why? Because Matthew's writing to the Jews, and the Jews would know what that phrase or image of the keys of the kingdom refers to. It comes from their Jewish tradition. And so you see how they wrote to a particular audience, which determined a particular message that they were trying to convey, and how they're going to persuade their audience about the truth of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, the authors were influenced by the certain conditions of time and culture. The way they spoke, the way they wrote, the way they thought, certain customs, etc. That all came into play in their authorship. They used specific literary genres. So they might write one document as a historical narrative, and then they might write another document that's what we call apocalyptic literature. With all sorts of figures of speech and images and symbols right? Case in point, John the Apostle wrote the Gospel of John. That's a historical narrative. But he also wrote the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic. He wrote letters, three letters, short letters. Now these different types of genre are to be read differently. You don't read the apocalyptic literature of St. John like you read the historical narrative of Jesus' words and deeds. And finally, they used certain modes of speaking and narrating that were common for them in their particular time and culture. So they were real human authors. And this is what the Catechism is affirming when it's referring to, once again, De Verbum from the Second Vatican Council. So as we've stated already, there's the divine quality, but at the same time, there is this human element as well. The authors are real human authors. Second catechetical point about the human quality is that discovering the author's intention is absolutely necessary for a correct interpretation of Scripture. And this, my dear friends, is what the church refers to as the literal sense. Okay? As I was speaking with uh, this wonderful woman here over the break, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. <laughs> Uh, but over the break, we were talking about taking the Bible literally, right? And I was explaining, and it's important to note, that we as Catholics do believe in taking the Bible literally. What does that mean precisely? We mean, when we say we take the Bible literally, and we, re we look for the literal sense, what we mean by that is that we must look for what the author's intention is. What is the author intending to affirm? That's what we mean by the literal sense of the Bible. What's the author's intention? Now, when the author intends to convey something, he may use certain details that are figures of speech or metaphors, right? The author may use certain details that he doesn't intend for his audience to take on a literalistic level. So there's a distinction between taking the Bible according to its literal sense, what the author intends, and reading the Bible literalistically. So for example, case in point, the creation story, right? Six-day su succession. 
the literal sense is what the author intends to communicate. This using these figures and these images as a literary framework to communicate certain theological and anthropological truths. Truths about God, truths about man, right? He does not intend for his reader to take the six-day succession literalistically as the universe coming into existence over six 24-hour periods. So there's a literal sense, and then there's also taking things in a literalistic way. So what we're referring to here is that because there is a human quality of the sacred text of Scripture, we must look to the author's intention. That's the literal sense. Because as, as the church taught, all that the author affirms must be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit. You see? So here's what the Catechism says in paragraph 109. In sacred scripture, God speaks to man in a human way. To interpret scripture correctly, the reader must be attentive to what the human authors truly wanted to affirm and to what God wanted to reveal to us by their words. Close quote. So we must pay attention to the author's intention. Now the next question is, well, how in the world do we do that? Well, that's why they have good Catholic commentaries out there. For one, exa one example is Dr. Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch's commentary, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible Commentary. They have a single volume of the whole New Testament. They're working on the Old Testament right now. And they give you ways in which you can discover the author's intention. And we're going to see this in a minute. Well, let me go ahead and put it up here. Ways to discover the author's intention. This is found in paragraph 110 of the Catechism. Consider the conditions of time and culture, i.e. the historical context. They were Jews writing within a Jewish context. And so guess what? You got to know a little bit about Jewish custom modes of speech, Jewish thought, Jewish theology, geographical locations, Jewish scripture, Jewish prophecies. You got to know a lot about Jews in order to interpret correctly the intention of these Jewish, some are Gentile, but mostly Jewish authors. And Jesus was a Jew, so he's teaching in a Jewish context too, right? We also have to consider, secondly, secondly, literary genre. As mentioned before, you don't interpret the book of Revelation like you interpret the book of John, the Gospel of John. Thirdly, we must consider certain modes of speaking and narrating, which comes into play within this historical context as well. So these are ways in which we can discover the author's intentions, intention, and there are several kinds commentaries out there that help us do this. Another great commentary out there is, um, I think it's called the Catholic the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. It's a new uh, series of biblical commentaries that are developing right now. There's more to come. They only have like six volumes out so far, but they're working on more. Uh, there's also wonderful biblical scholars out there who write individual books on certain aspects of the Bible that help us out with this stuff. So you might look for Dr. Michael Barber, or you might look for Dr. Timothy Gray, Dr. Grant Petrie, Dr. Edward Sri, S-R-I, Dr. Scott Hahn. These are some of the leading Catholic biblical theologians in the church today. And in their writings and in their works, they help us discover the literal sense, namely the author's intention. And that's the foundation that we must establish in our Bible study. And it is upon that literal foundation that we begin to build with the other senses, namely the spiritual senses, the allegorical, the moral, how does it apply to my life, and the anagogical, how does it point to the future. You see, very often as Catholics, when we do Bible study, we sit around with our Bibles, we read a passage, and we say, well, what do you think about it? And what do I think about it? How does that apply to your life? How does it apply to my life? Is that bad? Absolutely not. That's absolutely good. It's beautiful. It's essential. We must do that. But notice that's all we tend to do as Catholics in a general sense. What we have to rediscover in Bible study is the literal sense first. What is the author, what is Jesus in a literal historical way trying to convey? Hey, that rhyme, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? 
what is he historically trying to convey and then based on that we can allow that historical truth to inspire meditation on applying the truth to our lives and how does it change my thought patterns how does it change my way of conducting my life and the way I live my life you see does that make sense okay so I just wanted to emphasize the importance of this literal sense of reading scripture in light of the human quality and the church affirms that okay now we move to section three of tonight's reflection and that is the canon of the Bible the word canon uh, simply refers to, in the way we use it today, the ancients and ancient Christianity in the early centuries of Christianity, the word canon uh, literally means like a rule or a measuring rod, right? But it was originally used in reference to the standard of belief with the sacred tradition. But it eventually, the term came to be used in reference to the standard of inspired books. That is, the authoritative list of which historical documents are indeed considered to be inspired by God. Now the first catechetical point that I want us to reflect upon right now is this. An infallible magisterium is absolutely necessary to determine the canon. What do I mean by that? An infallible magisterium, what does that refer to? Magisterium is a word that is used in reference to a body of teaching officials. Some official, official teacher, right? That's infallible. What does that mean? A body of official teachers, or perhaps even one official teacher, who is protected by God from teaching us error. You see? That's an infallible magisterium. Well, why is an infallible magisterium needed in order to determine the canon? Well, let's think about it. Okay. Let's assume, for argument's sake, that there is no voice on this earth that's infallible. There is no teacher on this planet that can speak for God and say, Thus saith the Lord, without error. If that's the case, the next question is, okay, well, how are we to know which historical documents are inspired by God, right? You can't, folks. Why? Because if I go to her and I say, which historical documents are inspired by God? She's going to say, A, B, C, just for argument's sake, right, for the lesson. She's going to say, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I'm going to ask her, I'm going to say, well, is your theological judgment, is your judgment subject to error? But remember, there's no infallible voice, right? So she's going to have to say what? Yes, my judgment of these books being inspired by God are subject to error. And so then I'm going to have to say, well, if it's subject to error, well, then can I have faith that these books, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, are inspired by God? No. I can say that's a good educated guess, right? So I come over here to our brother here and I say, what is your judgment about which historical books are inspired by God, both from the Jewish people and from the Christians? He says, X, Y, Z plus A, B, C. And then I say, well, is your judgment subject to error? Because remember, there's no infallible voice, right? We're denying that in the hypothetical situation. He says, well, yeah, my judgment is subject to error. Well, if his judgment is subject to error, do I have reason to doubt him? Yes. And if I have reason to doubt his judgment, can I have faith in his judgment about what is inspired by God? No. And so therefore, his judgment is just simply what? An educated guess. It might be a good educated guess, better than some, but nevertheless, in essence, it's just an educated guess, a theory, an assumption. Well, my dear friends, we cannot have faith in educated guesses. We could not know definitively which historical documents have God as the primary author if there was no infallible voice on this earth. You see? And so an infallible magisterium is necessary to even know which historical documents belong in the Bible, which historical documents are considered to be inspired by God. 
So now that we know an infallible voice is necessary to tell us which documents are inspired, inspired by God, we have to ask the question, well, okay, well, who's infallible? Well, we can say Jesus, right? He's God. He is infallible. But did Jesus ever tell us which historical documents from the Jewish people and in the Christian tradition are inspired by God? No. Okay. Jesus never told us. And so we have to ask, well, did Jesus give the gift of infallibility to anybody after him? The answer would be yes. We as Catholics would say yes in the apostles, right? And if our Protestant friend says no, there's no infallible voice, well, then guess what? If, there, if the apostles weren't infallible and there's no infallible voice today, can we know what's the Bible? No. But we as Catholics say the apostles were infallible, but did the apostles ever tell us which historical books are inspired by God? Did they ever give us a list in their writings? No. And so the next question is, were, were there other men beyond the apostles that succeeded the apostles in their authority to infallibly proclaim the truth about God's revelation. Now our Protestant brothers and sisters will say, no, there is not. And so therefore there is no infallible voice on this earth to this day. Well, if there's no infallible voice on earth to this day and the apostles nor Jesus never told us what belongs in the Bible, well then guess what? All I can do is make an educated guess. But my dear friends, the good news is that Jesus did give us an infallible voice. Peter and the apostles, and the apostles united to Peter, and the Peter and the apostles ordained other men to succeed them in their ministry. So that we have Pope Benedict XVI today, the 264th successor to St. Peter, and the bishops throughout the world united with him, and whoever the next pope might be at the end of February, right? Who is the infallible voice voice to declare for us on this earth what is the truth of God's revelation. So the next question is, well, when did the infallible voice succeeding Peter, the Pope, ever tell us what the definitive list of books was? I'm going to answer that question in a few moments. But first, I want you to see and feel uh, the, the weight of how literally, even in the Jewish tradition, in the Old Testament days, there was no definitive canon of the Bible. Whether for the Old Testament or even the New Testament in the Christian tradition, there was no definitive canon or list of the Bible until the late 4th century. So let's start with the diversity over the Old Testament canon. You see, there was never any definitive list of what the Jews believed to be inspired by God. There were various canonical traditions, meaning traditions about which collection of writings are inspired by God but it was never unified. There was diversity. So for example, the Sadducees and the Samaritans, they believed only in the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch or the Torah. They rejected all other writings to be inspired by God. That's why they were sad, you see? <laughs> they were missing out on the inspiration of God. Now, I, that's not, I didn't make that up. I stole that from other theologians, okay? So I can't I can't, I can't claim the fame on that one. Secondly, there's a Jewish document that's not considered inspired, but it's a historical Jewish document known as 4th Ezra. And in that historical document, it speaks of 94 books being inspired by God among a particular tradition of Jews. 24 public, 70 books being secret. That's a lot different than what we have in our Old Testament today, right? Even our Protestant brothers and sisters. What's that? I'm not quite sure. All I know is that in the 4th Ezra, it simply says 24 public, that is for the public, and then 70 secret books that are not for the public to, to read and, and to be learned in, okay? That's, that's the extent of my knowledge on it. Thirdly, there were the, a group of Jews known as the Essenes, right? Uh, the Essenes are that particular group of Jews that were the Dead Sea Scrolls, are you familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran community? 
their scrolls included the proto-canonical books, and what that means is the books that we have in our Old Testament, right? Okay, and even our Protestant brothers and sisters that they have in their Old Testament, because there's a difference. We're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, there's a difference between the Catholic Old Testament and the Protestant Old Testament. But the Essenes had all of those proto-canonical books of the Old Testament that we share with our Protestant brothers and sisters, except Esther, and they actually had some of what we refer to as the deuterocanonical books. That is, those books that we have as Catholics but Protestants do not have in their own testament. The Essene community and the Qumran community actually had some of the deuterocanonical books. And they even had an Aramaic version of Tobit and the Hebrew version of Sirach. S Jewish text that we accept as Catholics to be inspired, but Protestants don't. But notice how this particular group of the Essenes believed in those texts to be inspired. And they also included other works that we don't consider to be inspired, such as the work of Jubilees or the, the, the book of Enoch, right? And it's interesting, I think it's in Jude... Jude actually refers to the bodily assumption of Moses. It talks about Moses' body and he's actually quoting this certain idea or this referring to this idea coming from the book of Enoch, this ancient Jewish writing. So once again, we see diversity even among the Jews in the Old Testament. Then you also had what is referred to as the Septuagint. This was the Greek version of the Jewish scriptures. In 250 BC, uh, Ptolemy, it was, I think it was Ptolemy II, King Ptolemy II, who, who reigned in, over Alexandria, Egypt, and had the massive library there in Alexandria, Egypt, and having all of the, the, the famous writings collected there in this great library, he initiated this project of translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And that process would, would continue over, you know, all the way up into the first century BC. But by the first century BC, this collection of Jewish writings included the seven deuterocanonical books that we have in our Bible, but Protestants don't, okay? So this was a particular Jewish tradition stemming from Alexandria, Egypt. Some scholars refer to it as the Alexandrian canonical tradition. That is the Greek Septuagint. Now, the Jewish Christians, you know, during the days of Jesus and then following Jesus, the authors of the New Testament, they used the Septuagint. So their canonical tradition was actually distinct and different from the Sadducees and the Essenes, right? But they used it, we, and the reason why we know the New Testament authors used the Septuagint is because 90% of the Old Testament quotes that we find in the New Testament, guess what? They don't come from the Hebrew version of the Jewish text. They come from the Greek version. And if they're quoting the Greek version of the Jewish scriptures, well then they're holding fast to that canonical tradition, that collection of writings that includes the seven books that we have in our Catholic Bibles, but Protestants do not have. So the early Christians held to those books to be inspired by God. Then we go into the first century, around 90 AD, the Jewish historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus, he wrote writes in his works that at the time of 90 AD, the Jews held to a 22-book canonical tradition, that there were 22 books inspired by God. Then we go all the way to 200 AD. The debate continues within the Jewish community. There was Jewish debate over the book of Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs from some of the writings of the rabbis debating, uh, for example, uh, the school of Shammai believed that the book of Ecclesiastes does not render, that is, uh, does, is not sacred scripture. The school of Hillel believed that it was sacred scripture. There was also debate over the Song of Songs. We go all the way to 300 and 320 to 300 in 50 AD. There was still debate among the Jewish communities over the book of Sirach and whether that was inspired by God. So we see that there was diversity over the Old Testament canon. In the Old Testament, in that, in that particular time frame, at the time of Jesus still, all the way until the 4th century AD. 
debate within the Jewish community over the canon of Scripture. We also see diversity over the New Testament canon, even among the Christians. So there were certain books, there were certain books that we consider to be a Scripture now and inspired by God that was debated in the first few centuries of Christianity. For example, the book of Hebrews, 2nd and 3rd John, James, the epistle of James, 2nd Peter, and the book of Revelation itself. Many Christians doubted whether these books were considered to be inspired by God. And there were other historical documents that we don't accept as scripture today, but in the first few centuries of Christianity, they did believe to be inspired by God. So for example, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, and even Pope Clement's letter to the Corinthians in 90 AD which is a beautiful letter. And he's writing to settle disputes among the local church in Corinth when John the Apostle is still alive. And here you have this third successor to St. Peter as the Bishop of Rome settling disputes for a local church way across the known world, <laughs> way across the Mediterranean Sea, signifying the supreme authority of the Bishop of Rome, the successor to St. Peter, you see. So the point being is that there there was diversity over the Old Testament canon. There was diversity over the New Testament canon. And so there was no definitive list of which books are considered canonical until a successor to Peter by the name of Pope Damasus I at a synod of Rome in 382 AD when he officially and definitively gave this list of books that we have today in our Catholic Bibles. Okay? And then that would be reaffirmed at the Council of Hippo in 393 AD, the Council of Carthage in 397, the Latin Vulgate in 400 AD that St. Jerome did for us, right? Which is still the official Bible of the Catholic Church. The Latin language is the official language of our Bible and even all of the uh, ecclesiastical documents that the Pope puts out. Then it was reaffirmed at the Council of Florence in 1441 AD and the Council of Trent in 1546 AD. So we see how there was all these different traditions among the Jews, among the Christians, about what scripture is, about which historical documents are inspired by God. And it took the infallible voice on this earth, a successor to St. Peter, to officially give us a definitive list. Now why is it that Protestants have a different Old Testament canon than the Catholics? Well, that originated with Martin Luther in the 16th century who began what is commonly referred to as the Protestant Reformation. And there were seven books in particular that Christians had always held to as inspired by God that he rejected. Now it was, a claim, it was claimed that he rejected these books because it was the so-called Jewish canon, okay? That can be identified with going back to 90 AD when Josephus talked about the 22 books. The modern Jewish canon seems to match up with what Josephus gives us. Now, you might be thinking, well, the Protestants have 39 books, that's 22 books. It's the way the books are organized and what is in which book and all of that stuff, but the content pretty much matches up with all the way back to Josephus in 90 AD, right? But here's the problem with that. What authority do the Jewish people have in 90 AD to declare for us what is the Word of God? None! They don't have authority. Josephus doesn't, nor any Jewish rabbi has any authority. Why? Because that authority was, they were, let me put it like this, they were divested of their authority with the advent of Christ. And he transferred that high priestly authority and that teaching authority from the Jewish elders of the Old Testament, the Jewish religious leaders of God's people, the Israelites. He transferred that authority to the apostles in Matthew 18, 18, when he says, whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loosed in heaven. So it's the apostles and their successors that have the authority of God to declare for us what is God's revelation. And those successors eventually did that for us in 382 AD, Pope Damasus I giving us that list of Bibles. Okay? So my dear friends, the canonical tradition that the Catholic Church accepted is that canonical tradition that was one among many Jewish communities. 
But we do know for sure one canonical tradition that Jesus and the apostles used and referred to. Whereas the Protestant canonical tradition is a canonical tradition that is one canonical tradition among many indeed. But a canonical tradition that comes from, that seems to assert that it's the only Jewish canonical tradition, right? But it wasn't the only Jewish canonical tradition. So you can't go around, Martin Luther is, is flawed in his argument saying, well, we're going to have these 39 books because that's what the Jews had. Well, well, hello, McFly, right? There were many Jewish canonical traditions. You just picked one of them. And we're picking the canonical tradition that Jesus and the apostles followed. Okay, now, we move off of that topic of the canon of the Bible, and we conclude with the importance of sacred scripture in the life of the church. And you can find this in paragraphs 131 to 133 of the Catechism. And what I want to do for you is, as you have there on your handout, I want us to go through these excerpts that come from Dei Verbum, the dogmatic constitution on the Word of God from the Second Vatican Council. First of all, quote, It follows that all the preaching of the church, as indeed the entire Christian religion, should be nourished and ruled by sacred scripture, close quote. All preaching, friends, the entire Christian religion should be nourished and ruled by sacred scripture. So contrary to popular thought that the Catholic Church doesn't believe in the Bible or the Catholic Church doesn't um, exalt the Bible, contrary to that thought, as we see here from the Second Vatican Council, the church, high, the church holds the sacred scriptures in high esteem. You know, many times, the, the, the number one common thought that I encounter in talking to folks is the following. You know, the frustrating thing about the Catholic Church is that the Catholic Church just doesn't uh, do Bible study, right? Or the Catholic Church doesn't believe in the Bible that much. It's a common thought that's prevalent among many Catholics sitting in the pew. To which I have to respond and let them know that maybe perhaps you're not hearing it from the pulpit. I might agree with that. Not this particular church, but just in general. Very often we don't hear from the pulpit about the importance of the Word of God and how we need to study sacred scripture, etc., etc. Maybe perhaps we don't experience a lot of Bible study in parishes in, in the Catholic Church in a general sense, but it's in the documents, right? It's in the church's teaching definitively, namely the importance of sacred scripture for the life of the church. Secondly, another excerpt here, very enlightening. The nourish, in regard to the nourishment of scriptures, it states this. This nourishment enlightens the mind, strengthens the will, and fires the hearts of men and women with the love of God. I want you to note this, the dimension of sanctity here and how sanctity is tied in with study of sacred scripture. Sacred scripture can enlighten the mind, that is give the mind truth, which is what the mind is made for. We're made for truth, right? Just like the mouth is made to open and to close on food, <laughs> the mind is made to open, to be open, but to close on the truth. You know this modern idea of keep your mind open, have an open mind, be open-minded. Yeah, there's a half truth to that. We got to be open-minded. But whenever it gets the truth, you close on the truth and you reject that which is not true, right? Okay? So it enlightens the mind. Notice, it strengthens the will. And it fires the hearts with love of God. Folks, it's the love of God in the heart that makes us holy, that constitutes us as saints. And so sacred scripture, as we read it and learn it and study and pray it, can enkindle within us a great love for God, which ultimately leads to heaven, folks. So sacred scripture is an absolute necessity for our journey of, in holiness and climbing the mountain of sanctity. Another excerpt, a bit long, so please bear with me. Sacred theology relies on the written word of God taken together with sacred tradition as its permanent foundation. By this word, it is powerfully strengthened and constantly rejuvenated as it searches out under the light of faith all the truth stored up in the mystery of Christ. The study of the sacred page should be the very soul of sacred theology. 
Continuing the quote, the ministry of the word too, pastoral preaching, catechetics, which is what we're doing here, and all forms of Christian instruction, among which the liturgical homily should hold pride of place, gains healthy nourishment and holy vitality from the word of Scripture. Okay? This is fabulous. What the, what the Second Vatican Council is telling us here is that every aspect of Christian instruction must be imbued with Scripture. Must be founded on sacred Scripture. So sacred Scripture must permeate every aspect of Christian instruction. And what holds the pride of place for that scriptural instruction? The homily. And so our priests are called in the homily to convey to us a homily that is embedded and imbued and permeated with sacred scripture. Explaining and expounding the scriptures for us. The literal sense. What the author's intention is. What Jesus is intending in the literal historical context. And then also the moral sense. How does it apply to our life? And the anagogical sense. How does it point to the future and the end times? All that good stuff, right? Everything we've been talking about. The homily holds pride of place for this scriptural instruction. Finally, the Second Vatican Council states, So may it come that by the reading and study of the sacred books, the word of God may speed on and triumph. Quoting Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. And the treasure of revelation entrusted to the church may more and more fill people's hearts. So as we... Uh, transmit the sacred scripture as we teach scripture as we study it and as we learn it it fills hearts with the sacred treasure of divine revelation allowing the word of God to speed on and triumph finally a couple of notes here the catechism of the Catholic Church if I've counted correctly one day I actually went through it and counted all of the distinct references to sacred scripture not including the multiple citations you know so not including the other times when it references the same scripture passage I've counted 2,887 distinct scriptural references in the catechism of the Catholic Church Folks, that's a lot of Bible, don't you think? And that gives us a clue into the importance of sacred scripture in the life of the church, and in particular, in catechesis. In teaching the creed and what we believe, in teaching the liturgy and what we celebrate, in teaching the moral life and the way we live our faith, and in teaching prayer, the way we pray our faith. Scripture must permeate every aspect of our catechetical instruction and Christian instruction. Finally, I'll leave you with a quote from St. Jerome. St. Jerome once said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Now, in particular, interestingly enough, St. Jerome was referring, from what I understand, to the Old Testament scriptures, insinuating that you cannot fully understand and appreciate the revelation in Jesus unless you first know the story that came before him and and led up to him. But obviously, in light of the declaration of the church, we know that the New Testament documents are scripture as well. So whether we're referring to the old and the new or the old and the new together, we can say with St. Jerome, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And that's very profound. So if we want to come to know Christ, to grow in our knowledge of him, both intellectually and academically, but most importantly, experientially, right? To come to know him on an intimate level, personally speaking, then it's important for us to read, to pray, to study the sacred page. Amen? Okay, so let's close with a brief prayer, and then if you have, I'll, I'll open it up for questions, okay? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's just pray in our Father together in thanksgiving to God our Father for this wonderful opportunity to meditate upon our Catholic faith, and in particular, the sacred scriptures. And so we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and for Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.